Thank you. Welcome back this afternoon. Sarah and I are delighted to be here and um, talking to you a little bit more about HMS Florida. Um, the ocean literacy part of this paper came from a joint session with the UNESCO Committee, Public Education and Interpretation Committee, and with the uh, Heritage at Risk Newly Formed Committee at Society for Historic Archaeology. We did kind of a nice deep dive into ocean literacy, what that is, what are the tenants, um, the educators, the scientists, that were involved. And so this paper is not going to focus on that, but at that time, we imagine what it would be like to apply some of those principles to what we were already doing at SPAN. It turns out we've been doing a lot with um, submerged literacy education uh, outreach events for a while, but applying it um, through Heritage Mind Scouts is quite new, and that reflects a lot of the work by uh, Geneva Wright and Sarah works with very closely down in South Florida. You heard a little bit yesterday about the Florida Public Archaeology Network and our mission. So I just wanted to jump right into some evaluation, preliminary evaluation assessment of the program as it stands just two years later. So I've presented the first year numbers before, and these are cumulative. We have 864 reports submitted as of uh, the end of that annual year. And what we're asking people to do is go out into the field to monitor sites using their phone or using some forms. They do this individually or as part of training. And they have many ways to be involved. So we have 864 sites that had not been reported on previously, which is pretty cool. Um, then we thought it made sense to evaluate HMS as it is a public engagement program through the engagement pyramid. And you see our numbers kind of stack up nicely as we go up through the different levels. But this uh, was a nice heuristic device for thinking of how do we want different people to engage with HMS Florida? How will we know we're doing well? Um, the nice thing about the pyramid is people are meant to move up and down. You don't want your leaders to stay up there and get exhausted. So it's OK if people go up and down and allow for that in your uh, structure of your program. We have. Um, this number is probably exponentially higher, so we've had a lot of media out the last year. We do have an NMARC group on Facebook, so I invite you all to join. It's our effort to increase our own literacy on the topic and that of the public and the scouts. We have 432 scouts registered, but I like uh, the citizen remarks of how many people are actually active each year, and that number goes up and down a little bit. Um, and then we do have a current leader at 129 sites with somebody I've never even met. To me, that's a great example that uh, hopefully the program is working. I'm going to fly through some stats about HMS, but from the site reporting side, I think we owe something to the state and for their trust in us to let them know what we were taking a look at. Most of the sites reported are on state land, which the program is designed to do, so that's excellent. And we also have another sector of private, which I think the state views quite favorably since those are sites not in their management. Um, where's the question? Can scouts find these sites? And we found overwhelmingly, yes, they can find the sites. Some are not mapped in the right place and need to be corrected in just a small sliver of sites that cannot be found by the scouts. We monitor more than just archaeological sites. We're looking at cultural resources as defined by the Florida National Site Plan. So, first, um, the majority are archaeological sites, but we also have uh, historic cemeteries, which is great because we can release those site information quite freely for those, and we have some uh, pilot programs going on right now for historic structures, some other categories. Of the archaeological sites reported on, predominantly prehistoric sites, some historic, a few shipwrecks, and that number will go up thanks to Sarah and next year. And note these are again by the Florida Master Site File designation. Uh, just quickly looking at the threat levels year to year, and when we talk about prioritization, we are looking for the sites that are in good condition, with a high threat level. And these are pretty good numbers to see that a lot of the sites in good condition assessed by um, the scouts uh, have some of medium and low threats. Um, this shows how HMS is active. These are all the counties in Florida. And we're active in um, all 67 except for these, and in different ways. Scouts live in one county, they monitor in another. Training happens in one county, our partners are in another county. So there's a diverse way people are active with heritage modern scouts. I'm going to toggle between these real quickly. These are scouts by county. Um, the blue is last year, the orange is this year. Just to show, even within a year, uh, there's a lot of diversity between where people are going. And if we lose 
use one scout in one county, the whole line can potentially go away. So we're trying to look at that for retention rates. Also, the sites monitored by county. This was all one scout who has now got a medical issue. So I'm hoping you can see there's no more to our work. So knowing that we're at risk for sustainability. We do more than just monitoring activities. HMS was launched during the Tidally United event. That's when we get experts, we get our schools who's still on our own learning curve, we get the public just to push these issues a little further down the road. We are now up to four. Next year we'll be in Pensacola in August. We invite you to come. Here's some other products related to Heritage at Risk in Florida. We've got the Florida Archaeology Month theme to be Heritage at Risk. We have an exhibit that's moving around Florida and in some public libraries right now. And our role in advocacy for telling local officials that we have met about this topic, it's important to us, we vote about this topic, and we only met to them. And I'll leave you with some challenges as I pass the mic to Sarah, um, we'll first remote, and just know our top three is the entire state is the coastal zone. That's a pretty big challenge. We already have a stressed coastal environment, and the unknown scale um, obviously is a continued challenge. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. So yes, as you can see, a lot of challenges. Our entire state is extremely low lying. Uh, I'm from South Florida, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about South Florida. You guys might know it uh, from our beaches, <laughs> Miami Vice, so Dale, let's go. Um, so South Florida is um, extremely low lying. Uh, this is the NOAA sea level rise here with a three foot projection. All of our major cities will be inundated. Uh, the only reason this area is not inundated is because it hasn't been mapped in this particular uh, program yet. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, climate change is real, it's here, it's happening now, and it's worse than we think, right? So uh, here we are um, investigating a mound uh, following Irma. This tree wasn't actually knocked out of this mound. Uh, workers dragged some trees on top of the mound after the storm, so we see cleanup. Not only do the storm have an impact, uh, but also cleanup efforts have an impact as well. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that when I talk about uh, submerged sites. We also have, uh, this is me documenting a uh, archaic shell mitten. So this is a 6,000 year old shell mitten. On top, this is a World War II era uh, infrastructure. This is a road. This isn't even a storm. This is just a heavy rain that's destroyed this entire section of the site, right? Um, so these are some of the challenges we're facing, uh, like all of you all. Um, in the U.S., we have a little bit of a unique situation, so we're not really seeing a lot of proactivity on the part of the federal or the state government. So one of the great things about living in South Florida, um, where you can see the effects of climate change every day, uh, is the four southeast counties, so Broward, Miami-Dade, uh, Monroe, and Palm Beach, said we're not getting help to face the issues we're seeing. So they developed uh, what's called the Quad County Climate Compact, or the Regional Climate Action Plan, I encourage everyone to check it out. It's uh, a non-binding agreement between these different counties to do things like help each other out after storms, and then there's various adaptation and mitigation measures. So everything from trying to encourage people to bike more uh, to other city infrastructure. Uh, it was founded 10 years ago. The original compact did not have any mention of archaeology or historical resources. So working with my colleagues, uh, we managed to get archaeology included. Uh, so what, right now, the first two points are identifying and mapping at-risk historic and archaeological resources, uh, and then establish a ranking or prioritization. So we're in the process of that now. As you all know, it's complicated. So I welcome your advice on that. Uh, here's what uh, some of the action plan looks like in practice. Uh, here we are monitoring uh, at the local level in Miami-Dade. This is a site along the Olita River, so we have uh, erosion and deposition. Uh, this site currently, uh, you can't get in this water because it's full of gross bacteria. So uh, that's another issue we see with uh, trying to access sites is uh, basic sanitation issues. Uh, this is what raising streets look like if no one has, uh, if anyone here has not seen that. Um, so this is, I'm standing on a normal street. Here's where the street's gonna be, I'm five six. All the fire hydrants have to go up. They build little ramps for garbage cans because garbage people can't pick up the cans anymore. It's a major infrastructure project. So this is what's happening uh, in the background uh, down in South Florida. And obviously, climate change is not good for underwater sites either. Uh, so why are we talking about submerged sites? Uh, there's a misperception uh, that uh, if something is already submerged, it's going to be fine as sea levels increase. 
degrees. But obviously that's not true, right? We see basic uh, temperature changes can impact uh, sunlight and ocean life, which then have a negative effect on uh, wrecks and other underwater sites. Um, maintaining the equilibrium of a site is incredibly important. And also, uh, a lot of our wrecks in the Florida Keys are extremely shallow. That's why there's so many of them there. The water is very shallow. And that first uh, three meters uh, below the surface is some of the most dynamic uh, in the ocean, as you know if you're um, a diver. Um, so we wanted to engage people with documenting this change to underwater sites as well as the above ground sites. Uh, I mean, as well as the terrestrial sites. Uh, and I was really, I know Sarah talked a little bit about uh, how this program uh, became, or how we plugged into the HMS program and in this Geneva Right. Uh, but for me, what really necessitated getting this program going was last year after Irma, going around to different dive shops in the Keys and dive instructors telling me, hey, I used to not be able to see uh, this part of the Hennebel, or I found this anchor, do you all know about it? So Irma was a depositional event, which means that a ton of sand was dumped onto our sites, our coastal sites. So the good news is that our coastal sites did uh, rather well during the storm on the East Coast, um, but that sand was coming from somewhere, and where it was coming from was obviously uh, where it had been protecting these submerged sites. So I was like, we have to get local people um, equipped because all the dive community really wanted to help us out there. Uh, and it plugged into some of our existing FPEN programs, so like our Heritage Awareness Dive Center, which uh, teaches dive instructors how to document sites and seas, which is to teach sport divers how to uh, essentially anomaly jump and uh, you know alert us to possible new shipwrecks. Uh, it was developed in partnership with the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, Here's what the monitoring form looks like. Uh, in addition to what you would typically record on a terrestrial site, we ask people to record things like uh, the presence of coral and seagrass. Uh, in the Florida Keys, we have a major, we're in the middle of a major coral die-off, uh, as are many parts of the world. So that is an indicator of climate change. <clears throat> Pardon me. As well as uh, seagrass, because if you see seagrass migration, that can indicate climate change as well. Uh, so documenting this as well as things like uh, water temperature, um, pH, uh, and that type of thing help us um, help us figure out what's going on at the site. Uh, and essentially how this works is we do a one-day workshop where the morning is in the classroom, we talk about laws pertaining to cultural resources, how to fill out the form, um, and in the afternoon or the next day we actually go out to a rec. Um, one of the most uh, critical parts of this is site jurisdiction, which happens, uh, this is an issue on land as well. Uh, every site, that it, one of the issues we're facing is that uh, different agencies aren't using the same numbering system. So our first priority is to make sure we're dealing with a uh, known rec or try and figure out some way of standardizing that. Um, but the plus side is that we're getting many more sites that were previously only listed at the federal level registered with the state. So that's a, an exciting, unanticipated side outcome uh, for us. And there you can see the map there. Uh, so what we teach uh, divers to focus on is um, obviously exposure and stability of objects underwater, chemical processes of shipwrecks, and monitoring protocol, right? So we don't want people out putting their hands on a shipwreck when they're taking a picture of the site. We want to um, teach them how to monitor it non-invasively. Uh, we want to set up a schedule of regular visits uh, to record these environmental conditions and then try to document um, with photos from fixed positions. Uh, here's some of the physical measurements that I previously discussed. Uh, establishing photo monitoring stations is very important. Uh, some of our federal partners, so NOAA, who uh, developed the program with us, you can't actually even use a measuring tape if you do not have an archaeological permit because the measuring tape may impact coral, it may impact seagrass. Okay, thank you. Uh, so you don't want to um, have any kind of negative impact. Um, and you also want to keep things consistent, so that's why we have the compass up there. Uh, like I said, we're building on these existing FPAN programs. So this is our Heritage Awareness Diving Seminar for dive instructors. They've been documenting this wreck since 2006. Um, as you can see in 2013, it's been significantly reduced. This is primarily because of looting. People think they see parts of a wreck and they think it's cool and they are uh, really want to bring it back with them for reasons that I have difficulty understanding. 
Um, but even in 2006, it's missing a lot of marine life, right? We don't see any coral or anything that's going to protect that site uh, from climate change. Uh, so here it is in 2013. Um, I was just up there a few months ago. Uh, it's not magically improving, it's continuing to deteriorate. Uh, so we're trying to build on these existing programs. Uh, our first submerged workshop was with NOAA in July of 2018. Uh, so far we've monitored 16 sites, which is very exciting. Uh, much like our terrestrial volunteers, we have incredibly eager submerged volunteers that get out and do a bunch of sites, and other people who enjoy the day but perhaps aren't uh, continue, continuing to uh, fill out a bunch of forms. Uh, we've received some uh, media attention for the program, which is great, from different outlets like uh, Atlas Obscura, and then our terrestrial program was featured in uh, The Atlantic. It's been picked up by the Miami Herald. So we're excited that it's, people are interested in this issue and interested to learn more. So I'd just like to thank, uh, obviously, all the FPAN staff, State Parks, Bureau of Archaeological Research, Florida Aquatic Preserves, and of course our 432 volunteers. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, this is one of our volunteers in Southwest Florida. I feel like I'm contributing in a small way to a very rational endeavor. Like, why are you doing this? Why are you interested in doing this? So, and of course, we'd also like to thank our co-author. He couldn't be here. He had to stay in Florida. So, that's for him. so thanks to Jeff as well. Uh, and if you want to uh, email us, there's our email addresses. Our cards are over there, and we're happy to talk after. So, and thank you very much to the organizers. Thank you.